This video was made with support from my patrons, whose names are on screen now. If you want to, you can join them today and even get access to exclusive content. The link to my Patreon is in the description, so check it out if you're interested. Anyway, on with the show. Endurance racing is the ultimate test for man and machine. You take racing, the pursuit of being the fastest, and combine that with patience, longevity, and perseverance. Just making it to the end of an endurance race is an achievement in and of itself. So the satisfaction that comes from winning one must be an unparalleled feeling. The amount of pitfalls that have to be navigated throughout the course of one of these races is truly staggering. From driver errors to team mistakes and mechanical issues, any number of things could go wrong at any time. And in many cases, it's just sheer bad luck. It's not surprising that endurance races have always carried a mystique about them. So I guess it's only natural that people would want to replicate this in the realm of video games. There have been many racing games that have tried to capture this same feeling, but whenever someone mentions endurance races in racing games, there is always one name you're guaranteed to see. Gran Turismo. From its inception in 1997, Gran Turismo brought car culture and motorsport to the masses. The original Gran Turismo still sits as the all-time best-selling game for one of the all-time best-selling consoles. And aside from its sequel, there are still no other racing games in the top 20 PS1 bestsellers. That was how much of an outlier it was at the time. People who had previously only seen cars as a means to an end were now talking about turbo kits and tyre compounds. It really was a revolution in terms of how cars and racing were viewed in the public consciousness. And even from the very start, endurance racing was always a feature. So what we're going to do today is take a trip through Gran Turismo history with our focus being on the endurance events. Some would argue that they represent the pinnacle of racing on Gran Turismo, but is this really true? And how has the experience changed over the course of the series as the focus has shifted? That's what we're going to find out today. So something we need to clear up before we get started is how do we define an endurance race? That is a bit difficult, because as far as I can tell, there is no official definition. The duration of a race can be measured in two ways, total distance or total time. In most places, endurances seem to be defined as racing events taking place over a large distance, which is extremely vague. Personally speaking, I've always considered anything longer than 2 hours or 300 kilometers as an endurance race. This is because in Formula 1, a standard Grand Prix takes place over roughly 300 kilometers with a maximum 2 hour time limit. Driver swaps are also commonly associated with endurance racing, but not exclusively, so many people consider those as essential for a race being called an endurance. The reason I bring all of this up is because when it comes to Gran Turismo, the officially labelled endurance races can last anywhere between 50 minutes to 24 hours. So just bear that in mind as we talk about them further. Starting with the original Gran Turismo of course, endurance races are found in the special event section. In my opinion, special events are a bit of a misnomer, since the bulk of the events are found there, including many event types that we're all familiar with. Essentially, they're just named that way to differentiate them from the main GT League Championships. But special event is an apt description for these endurance races, which are like nothing else in GT1. The thing about GT1 is that every other event is a multiple race scored championship. So these single race endurances, taking place over many laps, are clearly different, although that's not easy to tell from how they appear in the menu. We've got three races here, Special Stage Route 11 All Night 1, Special Stage Route 11 All Night 2, taking place on the reverse version, and finally, the Grand Valley 300 kilometers. Both of these circuits, Special Stage Route 11 and Grand Valley Speedway, are the two longest circuits in the game, so I suppose it makes sense that they would host the longest races. Starting with the first race at Route 11, it takes place over 30 laps, lasting roughly 55 minutes, and you'll come up against a selection of fully-fledged race cars as your opponents. 
There is a decent spread of performance here, with your rivals ranging from lightweight touring cars like the Nissan Primera and Mazda Lantis, to big powerful GT cars like the Skyline GTRs and Mitsubishi GTOs. The second race at Route 11 is on the reverse circuit, like I mentioned, but interestingly is only open to production cars, no racing models. Again, the race is 30 laps and your possible opponents will pretty much just be the road car versions of the opponents from the first race. But then we get to Grand Valley. The Grand Valley 300 kilometers takes place over 60 laps, which is roughly 300 kilometers, and that means it is easily the longest of the three races, lasting roughly as long as both Route 11 endurances combined. Your pool of possible opponents is pretty much the same as the first race at Route 11 with a mix of race cars. Given all of this, I view it as pretty much the de facto endurance of GT1, and I'd wager that this race played a big part in Grand Valley being viewed as the track of Gran Turismo by some people, which will become more evident as we go on. Of course, giving the legendary Castrol Supra as the prize car only added to that legacy. Being honest, the endurance races in GT1 are pretty much just like the normal races, but longer. However, there is one exception. These three races feature tyre wear. This adds a layer of strategy into the mix, as choosing which compound of tyres to use, and subsequently when to pit, is crucial. It isn't the most complex or in-depth thing in the world, but in terms of bringing these ideas from the world of motorsport to a mainstream audience, I think it does a pretty decent job, and that was what the original Gran Turismo was all about. So what I'm going to do now is give an overall rating for the endurance races in GT1. I'll do this for all of the later games as well. What this rating is based on is primarily how they fit into the wider context of the game through the unique experience they can offer and how well they translate the ideas of real endurance racing into the game, given what was possible at the time. With that said, I'll give the endurances in GT1 a 6 out of 10. Three races across two different circuits with not much theming around the events themselves, but they're perfectly serviceable and fulfill their purpose well. The inclusion of tyre wear and pit stops, matched with having multiple tyre compounds, was a great choice and adds a little bit of depth to the experience. Being the first game, it realistically wasn't going to feel super authentic, of course none of the tracks were even real, but they did a solid job and you couldn't really expect much more from them. But what this meant is that for its sequel, Gran Turismo 2, they would be expected to raise the bar. And raise the bar they did. Firstly, the endurance races were now separated into their own category, no longer just under special events, and the number of endurance events had increased from 3 to 7, most of which taking place at brand new circuits. The Grand Valley 300 kilometers had returned, now featuring road cars as opponents, but as Route 11 was cut from GT2, Special Stage Route 5 would host the all-night endurance instead. Laguna Seca became the first real-world track in the series, and the first to host an endurance race with the Laguna Seca 200 miles. The new Rome Street Circuit also had a first, with the Millennium in Rome Endurance being the first to be time-limited. Two hours in this case, but the race could end sooner if you completed 99 laps within that time. Whereas the races in GT1 had very basic theming, either an assortment of race cars or road cars, the theming for GT2's endurances was a lot more interesting. Take the trial mount in two hours, which features primarily European hatchbacks, sedans and sports cars. Or the Seattle Circuit 100 miles, where you'll come up against a mixture of classic and modern muscle cars. Modern at the time, of course. The much broader variety of cars in GT2 when compared to GT1 allowed the developers to get more creative with these events. Although, sometimes things got a little bit too creative with the NTSCU version 1.0 of the game having a glitch that caused opponent cars to end up in different events which they weren't intended to, with the endurance races being the worst affected. Thankfully, this was patched for all future versions of the game. In GT1, all of the endurances required an International A license to enter, meaning that they were intended as late game events. With GT2, there are a couple of these endurances that only need an International B license, which will still take some effort, but the opponents in these races also aren't that tough. The Trial Mountain event is the perfect example, but the other International B endurance at Apricot Hill features sports cars like the TVR Griffith and Toyota Supra. And the AI tends to spin out at turn 2, which also makes the race a bit easier. What's notable is that endurance races in GT2 can give out two possible prize cars with a random 50-50 chance to receive either. Unlike some future games, this roulette is unseen, and so for many people who played the game when it first came out, they likely wouldn't have known about this unless they won the race again and received a different car. 
The only endurance race which has one possible prize car is again the Trial Mountain 30 laps, and the car you receive can have some game-breaking implications. I talked about these GT2 endurance race oddities in another video, so check that out if you're interested. Now, in terms of the gameplay of these events, nothing really changed. They still feature tyre wear, but nothing else is really added into the mix. The timed event at Rome is the only noticeable addition. So, my rating for the endurances in GT2 is 8 out of 10. The variety of events has been fleshed out, which was great to see. The theme of the events was also a lot more interesting. Although, like many other events in GT2, you don't have to abide by any car restrictions other than a power limit. Personally though, I think it's more fun if you place the same restrictions on yourself, like only using US muscle cars at Seattle, GT500s at Laguna Seca, etc. GT2's endurance races don't really try anything new, but it's debatable to what degree they realistically could add any new mechanics, as the original Gran Turismo was already pushing the PS1 to its technical limits. Still, they wouldn't have this excuse for Gran Turismo 3 on the PlayStation 2. GT3 introduced the League format, which we're also familiar with, and that would go on to define the structure of many of the future games in the series. And of course, endurance races were given their own entire League. Ten events in total, up from the seven in GT2. The Grand Valley 300 again returned, this time back as an event for GT race cars, as did the first All Night Endurance, which returned to the redesigned Special Stage Route 11. I'd say GT3 increased the variety of these events even further. You could find an event for lower performance European cars, like the Rome Endurance, unmodified sports cars, the Trial Mountain 2 Hours, factory tuned cars, the Super Speedway 150 miles, and even the first ever one make endurance for Mazda Roadsters at Apricot Hill. In this way, pretty much every endurance in GT3 is unique not just because of the track being different, but also because of the opponents, meaning that they all have their own individual theme. Every endurance in GT3 requires an international A license, just like GT1. In terms of prize cars, there's a very interesting selection, many of which can only be obtained as prizes. Each event has four possible prize cars, with one being chosen at random. The endurance races in GT3 are often seen as the best method to obtain a race car, as even events for lower performance cars can give them out, like the Trial Mountain and Rome two-hour endurances. And that's not even mentioning that each endurance has a 25% chance to give you a Formula 1 race car. Yes, even the one that can be done with a basic Mazda Roadster. Anyway, here's something interesting. GT3 has the Mistral 78 laps endurance at Côte d'Azur, which mirrors the real-life Monaco Grand Prix. Despite that, your opponents for this race will be mostly LM race cars, not the F1 machines. This might seem like an odd decision, but this is because the final race of the Formula GT Championship takes place at Côte d'Azur over 78 laps, so effectively it would just be the same race twice. Although that doesn't explain why they chose to make it an endurance as well. As GT3 was such a technical leap from GT2 in pretty much every way, you might be disappointed to know that not a whole lot changed when it came to the gameplay. Tire wear was still a factor, as well as appearing in non-endurance races for the first time, but there was still no fuel usage, variable time or weather, or any other new gameplay feature that could be derived from real-life racing. Many of these things had already featured in other titles, so from that perspective it wasn't the best. But what GT3 did to make up for that was improve in every other area. Tire warm-up and degradation had been made noticeably more authentic, and the combination of a more responsive and intuitive handling model and more consistent AI led to better, more realistic racing. Genuinely, some of the best racing I've ever had in Gran Turismo is from GT3's endurances. When you were able to perfectly match yourself with an AI opponent, you could have some incredible battles where strategy could play a crucial role. In that respect, it was night and day compared to GT2. So overall, I'll give GT3 a 9 out of 10 for this, continuing that trend of improvement. As I said, the event variety and selection was really interesting. The way prizes were handled added a layer of intrigue, even if it was a little bit broken. There wasn't anything new in terms of gameplay which you might have expected, but it did the basics so well that the actual racing was better than ever, so that almost didn't even matter. Regardless, it was clear from GT3 that endurance races could still be more fleshed out. There was plenty of inspiration to draw from and adapt into the game, so the goal for Gran Turismo 4's endurance races was clear, to fulfil the potential that we could all see was there.
If GT2 took GT1 and made it more international in terms of the car selection, GT4 did the same to GT3 when it came to the tracks. Where GT3 had only two real-life circuits, and one of them not even being officially licensed, GT4 had nine, and that's not including the fictional tracks at real-world locations. And of course, this had a major impact on the endurance events. From 10 races in GT3, there were now 16 in GT4, 12 of them at new circuits, and also 12 at real-world circuits. A handful had still been carried over, however, such as the eponymous Grand Valley 300, Laguna Seca 200, and Super Speedway 150. Now, an important thing to note is that in the previous three games, almost all of the endurance races lasted between one and two hours. The longest race you'll find was the Tokyo Route 246 100 laps endurance from GT3, which took closer to three hours. In GT4, three hours would be considered a short endurance. You'll now find races taking roughly four hours, five to six hours, eight to nine hours, and even 24 hours. There's three of those, in fact. To say they up the ante would be an understatement. Rolling starts were also included at some tracks to add to the realism of these events. In terms of other changes, the big one was that rather than the Endurance League being open from the start, it would now only unlock after 25% of the game had been completed. And of course, this changes how you interact with them during a playthrough. The license requirements are now able to be a lot more lenient when required. No more needing an International A license to race a stock MX-5, for example. In fact, the Roadster Endurance in GT4, which is now four hours long and takes place at Tsukuba, doesn't require any license. But as I said, as you can only access it after completing a quarter of the game already, the fact that you can win a Mazda RX-7 LM race car from it isn't very game-breaking like it would have been in the older games. And that takes us on to the prize cars. GT4 did away with the roulette, and now you always get the same car for winning a certain endurance race. In most cases, these are as expected, reflecting the difficulty of the event and time investment needed. But one notable exception is the El Capitan 200 miles. This race can be completed in roughly two hours, and you'll be up against some reasonably fast sports cars, like the Zonda C12 and Viper GTS. I wouldn't call it the easiest event in the world, but the fact that you win the legendary Toyota 88CV, aka the Minolta, seems a bit overkill. That's why this event is very well known to people who do challenge runs of GT4, because it's one of the easiest ways to obtain a Le Mans prototype, which you'll most likely need to win the GT World Championship. When it comes to event selection, there is again a decent variety, although some tracks do get reused, such as Sukuba, which has a 4-hour and a 9-hour endurance, the Nürburgring with a 4-hour and a 24-hour, and La Sarth, which has two 24-hour races, one each at the variance with and without the Mulsanne chicanes. This is excessive, in my opinion, especially when you consider how many other circuits there are in GT4 which don't have any enduros. There is some good event theming here, with many different types of cars catered to in each of these events, but quite a few opponent groups do get reused. For instance, this group, which consists of Japanese and German touring cars, and the Falcon XR8 for some reason, is used at Grand Valley, Tokyo, and Suzuka. It would have been nice to have curated opponents for each individual race, like GT3, but it's not the end of the world. But if you thought these 16 races were all the Enduros GT4 had to offer, then you've got another thing coming. If you take a wander into the European events, you'll discover the 1000 Miles event. Inspired by the real-life Mille Miglia, which was hosted between 1927 and 1957, in GT4, it's for classic cars dated 1970 and earlier. The event comprises of four races, which total a combined 1,000 miles, as the name suggests, each lasting roughly three to three and a half hours. It's also notable for having one of the biggest performance spread of opponents, ranging from 16 horsepower Fiat 500s to almost 500 horsepower AC 427s. Despite being in the European events, the event description mentions specifically Japanese and American cars, but there isn't any restriction and your opponents drive cars from all over the world. All of this leads me to believe these were originally intended to be in the endurance events, because that's pretty much what they are. So in reality, since two of these races are at Lasarth and the Nordschleife, these tracks actually have three endurance races each. They really milked them for everything they were worth. 
So, was there anything new? Yes, a couple of things actually. Along with tyre wear, fuel usage had finally been introduced, as well as fully animated pit stops, adding another long overdue layer of strategy to these races. But you didn't have to experience this for yourself, given that GT4's other innovation was B-Spec. B-Spec was a game mode in which you coached an AI driver who raced on your behalf, and could be used for most events in the game, including endurance races. And you could also switch between yourself and your B-Spec driver at pit stops, simulating driver changes which you would find in real-life enduros. Given that when the B-Spec driver was in control, you could even fast-forward time by times three, this made these super-long races a lot more doable for the average person. So, what's my verdict for these races in GT4? Again, I'll give it a 9 out of 10. Lots of events to choose from, with different types of cars, the possibility for interesting racing and new strategic options with fuel in the mix, and plenty of real-life inspiration in the events themselves. But in some ways, I feel like they were a little bit too ambitious with what they were trying to do. I mean, it's all well and good having a 24-hour race with a driver swap system, but you had to ask what was really the point of this when you still only have 5 opponents on the track and no variable time or weather. Inevitably, it just devolved into tedium. I wouldn't be surprised to find out that the main reason B-Spec came to exist was because of these races. It gives them an out, because instead of having these 24-hour races, which just seem insurmountable for the average person, who doesn't have the time or just doesn't want to leave their PS2 on for that long, they could just simulate it with B-Spec in a much more manageable 8 hours. But that does just devolve the experience into a checklist activity, rather than a challenge you'd want to face. That said, some mad lads have actually completed these 24-hour races entirely on their own, but I really wouldn't recommend doing that. Despite these drawbacks, it's clear that these races left quite an impact. When most people think of endurance races in Gran Turismo, more often than not, they'll picture GT4. They were just so iconic to the game, because at that time, no one had ever tried something like that in a racing game before. So, although I lament that they didn't try and add more game mechanics to really flesh it out, with Polyphony focusing on other areas with GT4, I appreciate their ambition. In some ways, it feels like with these super long enduros, they came up with the idea, of course inspired by the real life races, and created them entirely in a vacuum, forgetting the limitations of the game they were actually making them for. And, needless to say, given that the next entry in the series would be on next generation hardware, even more would be expected if they planned to continue down this route. The much anticipated Gran Turismo 5 finally released in November 2010. The Endurance League, now renamed as the Endurance Series, once again returned. This time, let's talk about the new features first. Variable time and weather had been fully implemented for many tracks, most notably Le Sarth and the Nürburgring, and larger grids of cars were now possible, up to 16. So, this was great, as it meant they could now do a lot more with these races. Well, let's take a look at the events themselves. In total, there are 9 endurance races, which is down from the 16 in GT4 and even 10 in GT3. And more disappointingly, only one of these events is actually new, the rest being copied over from GT4. The Grand Valley 300km again returned for its fifth successive game, and was the only event that had been changed in any major way, as it was now an event against road cars, as it was in GT2. So, what happened here? Where had all the creativity gone? Well, over the past few years, quite a lot of cut content has been discovered for GT5. On the cutting room floor page for GT5, there is a total of 23 events that were originally planned but eventually cut prior to release. This does go a long way to explain why GT5's GT mode felt lacking in many places, but our focus is on the endurance races. In total, there have been leftovers for 8 more endurance events discovered internally within GT5. These events are the Monza 2-hour endurance, Rome City Course 300km, Madrid City Course 4-hour endurance, Tokyo Route 246 300km, Fuji 1000km, 1000 miles, 24 hours of Le Mans 2, and the 4 hours of Daytona. So, four of these events are completely brand new events on new to GT5 circuits, with the other four being returning events from GT4. 
three of them even have event preview images, so it's not known why they were cut. But there is a theory that it was a deliberate choice, as every series within GT5 has nine events total, so they may have just wanted to keep this consistent, which would be very odd if true. Also, the image and event information text for 1000 miles implies that it's actually a three race event with races across both Le Sarth and the Nürburgring, just as it was a four race event in GT4, which would have been a first for an official endurance event to contain multiple races. Coming back to the races that actually made it into the game, the Indianapolis 500 miles was the only newcomer. Despite being based on the real life Indy 500 for open wheelers, GT5's rendition has you going up against Le Mans prototypes. Unlocking endurance races, like everything in GT5, is tied to your driver level. The first one to unlock is Grand Valley at level 25, going up to the Nürburgring 24 hours at level 40. So do the new features actually improve the experience much? I'd say that they certainly do, but there are still some disappointments with them. For one, out of the nine endurance races, only four take place at circuits that even have variable time or weather. Also, for whatever reason, GT5 only uses a maximum grid of 12 cars in career mode events, when 16 is possible. Another new feature was the ability to save mid-race if you weren't able to fully complete it in one sitting. This feature was not included from launch, but due to a large number of player requests, Polyphony included it in the Spec 2 update. But why would that matter if you could just use B-Spec, right? Well, B-Spec had been carried over into GT5, but now existed as its own separate career, meaning that they couldn't be used in your regular A-Spec endurance races, you had to do it all on your own. One quirk of the B-Spec career was that many of the races were made longer, even doubling in length in some cases. Fortunately, this doesn't apply to the B-Spec Endurance races, which must be done in real time, as the ability to fast forward was not included in GT5. What this means is that the best way to tackle the 24-hour races is to grab a bunch of friends and take turns doing it. Doing them entirely on your own, without the ability to save prior to Spec 2, sounds absolutely miserable. When it comes to GT5's Endurances, I give them a 7 out of 10. Yes, they had finally added the much requested features like variable time and weather and larger grids, so they started to feel like proper endurance races, but they were still lacking in quite a few ways. The selection of events was pretty underwhelming, especially when compared to the previous games, and the discovery of these cut races makes that fact even more frustrating. Beyond the new additions, not a lot was improved. The method of unlocking the events in such a linear way, due to the level system, was also frustrating, as this meant you were pretty much forced into doing them as late game events. Although that complaint can be made about many other things in GT5 because of the level system. Still, considering all of the features that have been added over the years, tyre wear, fuel usage, variable time and weather, and larger grids, it really felt like everything was coming together to make the ultimate form of endurance races, even if we expected GT5 to be the game that did that. It would be interesting to see what Gran Turismo 6 did with the formula. Let's cut straight to the chase. GT6 does not have any endurance races. Yes, after 16 years and 5 mainline games, Polyphony did away with endurance races but not entirely. You see, the final tier of events in GT6 are called the Super Events, as they're unlocked with the Super License, and in here you'll find what I call the Endurance Race Equivalents. You see, with GT6, Polyphony made the conscious decision to streamline the single player experience with the goal to seemingly make it more accessible. Making these shortened super events was all part of that. Instead of having the 24 hours of Le Mans or Nürburgring, you now had the 24 minutes of Le Mans and Nürburgring. So yeah, not exactly an endurance, even by classic Gran Turismo standards, but I'll still talk about them for the sake of this video. Just like GT5, we have nine events here, but one positive is that of these nine, five of them take place at all new circuits, and there's a sixth at the returning Apricot Hill as well. Other than the shorter Willow Springs 20 mile challenge, all of these races take roughly 20 to 25 minutes to complete, so they're fairly consistent in that respect. But to put these events in context, one of them is the Suzuka 10 lap challenge featuring GT500 race cars. But in GT5, an almost identical race could be found in the Super GT event as just one of three races in that event. In fact, in GT3, 10 lap races were the norm in the professional league, and yet in GT6 they were being treated as a special occasion. 
how the times had changed. B-Spec also took a back seat. It was only added in an update, but as the races were so short, it served basically no purpose other than for the chronically lazy. You didn't need to look far to see people lamenting Polyphony's decisions. I mean, after the endurances in GT4 and 5, to scale them back in the way they did just felt like a joke. But I do understand why they did it and the benefits of this. The idea of the 24 minute races at the Sarth, Nürburgring and Spa was to cram all the excitement of a 24 hour race into a fraction of the time. There was still changeable weather, as well as a time 60 time cycle to simulate a full day in game. There was even a limited time seasonal event for the 24 minutes of Daytona, which was briefly available around the start of 2015. I do have some good memories of these races, so I can't say they're all bad, but it was clearly disappointing that the supposed longest and toughest races in the game didn't even last half an hour. I feel like a 2.4 hour race with a times 10 time simulation would have been a much better solution personally. Another point was that, like almost every other event in GT6, they were plagued by the incredibly slow AI and mostly scripted rain whenever it was possible, which made the races pretty easy. One of the biggest offenders was the Nürburgring 24 minute challenge, which had a performance point limit of 650, with your main opponents coming in a little bit under that. But it was fairly easy to beat them with cars around 100 pp lower. This actually spawned a bit of a game of people seeing what sorts of ridiculous cars they could use to win, with some claiming to have won the race using cars like the old Mini Cooper, a Honda Odyssey, and even an original Fiat 500. Remember, this is a race where you come up against some pretty serious touring and GT cars, but people were able to make them look like a joke. It was its own sort of fun. That said, it still doesn't match the experiences of some hard-fought races in the previous games. As previously stated, these are far from actual endurance races, so I can't rate them fairly. If I were to rate them on their own, without the context of past endurance races, I'd give them a strong 8 out of 10. If their goal was to compress endurance races into a much shorter time frame with the use of accelerated time and exaggerated fuel usage and tyre wear, then I say they did a pretty good job. Playing them for the first time without knowing the best strategy can be thrilling, but more often than not, the limp AI, who would just roll over the moment you appeared in their mirrors, did put a damper on things. The variety of these events, many taking advantage of circuits new to the series, was pretty strong, but I felt like the theming of each could have been a bit more interesting. Such as, instead of having GT500s at the Brands Hatch 15 lap challenge, they could have used specifically British race cars, or just European cars. That would have made it more unique, since the same GT500s were used for the Suzuka 10 laps as well. Payouts for these races were decent, especially when compared to the endurance races of past games, but the lack of any prize cars or unique rewards for them was also a bit of a letdown. But that's more of a trend with GT6 in general. Still, as they were so short, it encouraged replaying them and trying to put your own spin to make them interesting, like coming up with your own unique challenges. If we compare these races to other races of similar length from past GT games, then the comparison is strong. But when they're advertised as the marquee events in the game, it just wasn't good enough. It always felt like these types of races should be the ones you find in the later championships, not as their own standalone thing. I mean, there is only so much that can happen in 24 minutes. You just don't get the same level of satisfaction from winning them. With GT Sport planning to take the series in a completely different direction, it remained to be seen whether proper endurance races would ever return. And when the game launched in October 2017, they didn't. In fact, there was hardly any career mode at all. Was the era of endurance racing in Gran Turismo gone for good? Well, the GT League had other ideas. In December, a couple of months after launch, the GT League mode was added, bringing a number of events in the classic Gran Turismo League format. And wouldn't you know, the Endurance League was there for everyone to see. I'm rocking. Initially, there were just two races, one for a Porsche One Mate Cup and another for Group 1 prototypes, but more would be added over the coming months and years. In total, by the time GT Sports stopped receiving regular updates, there were four events in the Endurance League, with a combined 25 races between them. The League and all of the events within them were unlocked after reaching driver level 30, and each race lasts roughly one hour. Of course, GT League wasn't quite the same as the GT mode from past games. Given that there were no championships or prize cars, etc., it meant that there were no real long-term goals. 
it was just an event list where you picked out which race you wanted to do. But remember when I said there were no endurance races included from launch? Yeah, I wasn't exactly telling the truth, because if we head over to the mission challenges, we can find some self-proclaimed endurance races. There are four in total, ranging from 15 minutes to about an hour, but there are a couple of really interesting things here. For one, two of these races are effectively multi-class. Mission 6-8 at Maggiore has a mixed field of Group 4 and Group 3 cars, and Mission 8-7 at Interlagos featuring Groups 1 and 3. In each case, the player drives a car in the faster group, with the slower group acting as traffic. Amazingly, this concept was never touched on in the previous games. As I've discussed, some races did have a noticeable spread of performance among the opponents, but they were never organised into specific classes. GT Sport doesn't fully do this either, with all of the cars being ranked on one position board, but the intent is clear. However, Mission 6-8 also does something else. Yep, you're reading that correctly. 30 cars. This event was even included in the open beta prior to the release of the game, showing what was now possible on the PS4. But this proved to be a red herring, because aside from this one particular race, every other race in the game is limited to 20 cars. The only exception being the online sport mode races for the fastest players in each region, which went up to 24 cars back in the day. So that was a major disappointment, and another was that GT Sport featured no dynamic time or weather, it was always static. In fact, until partway through 2019, it didn't feature wet weather at all. So considering everything, I'll give the endurances in GT Sport 7 out of 10. This rating is based purely on the races themselves, not including much context of how they fit into a full playthrough, because when it came to GT Sport, that was kind of irrelevant. The positives were that they had a good selection of races, with each being a decent length of roughly one hour. The introduction of fuel maps added more depth, as did their experiments with larger grids and multi-class races. The negatives were that there wasn't a huge amount of variety in the races found in the Endurance League, there was only four events in total, and they all played out pretty much the same. The AI was marginally better than in GT6, but still not great, with the game still resorting to long, drawn-out rolling starts to add any sort of difficulty. Although they experimented with larger grids and multi-class, they didn't do a whole lot with them, and the removal of dynamic time and weather was a big loss for longer races in general. But still, all of the pieces were there. Once again, it was just up to them to put it all together. With Gran Turismo 7 on the horizon, much more would be possible, and with Polyphony promising a true return to form for the series, including a full classic GT campaign, there was a real sense of optimism for what they could do. GT7 released on PS5 and PS4 in March 2022. One of the key new features added to the game was their all-new weather simulation, which promised the most authentic weather scenarios based on real-world data for each location. One of the main ways this was showcased was once again over in the mission challenges. Here you can find a handful of longer races, the Sakuba Circuit 30 laps, High Speed Ring 30 minutes, and even the Le Mans 24 minutes returning from GT6. And in each case, the changeable weather was a key factor, making strategy very important. These races are great, as they combine the new weather system with tyre wear and fuel usage to create some pretty unpredictable races and interesting scenarios. They're not perfect, however. Like almost every other race in GT7, they're plagued by the stupid drawn-out rolling starts, which became a trend in GT6 and have only become worse since then. Also, the rain is heavily scripted, so if you complete it once, you already know what's going to happen the next time. And the AI almost seem programmed to deliberately lose, as they have a tendency to pit just before the final lap. But these are just mission challenges, so what about endurance races in the main campaign? What sort of interesting ways could they have been implemented, and new events could they have come up with? Well, they didn't. GT7 everyone. Yeah, I don't want to get into it too much here, but the main campaign of GT7 didn't exactly live up to expectations. If you want to know why that is, I made a massive video series breaking it all down, so check that out. But when it comes to endurance racing specifically, when the game launched, those three mission events were your lot. If you were looking to get your fix from the regular events instead, then those would also be a letdown, since changeable weather, tyre wear and fuel usage are only used in a handful of races, and rarely ever all at the same time. It was a huge disappointment, especially for us long-time GT fans, but there was hope. 
Due to GT7 being absolutely raked over the coals after its first few weeks, due to the unbalanced economy and lacklustre single player, a number of changes and new things were quickly implemented. One of those being a set of eight one-hour endurance races which were added just one month after launch. I've said this before, but being honest, these eight races are by far my favourite part of GT7. Not only were they almost all unique, catering for different types of cars, but they showcased GT7's best features. As well as everything you could find in the three mission events in the base game, the AI were also noticeably sharper. They didn't have to use the long, drawn-out rolling start as a crutch to add any sort of jeopardy. That could be done by the racing alone. In some of these races, they're actually really fast. The race at Maggiore in Group 3 is probably the most well-known example, but it never felt unfair. It was just quite difficult. Hopefully this would serve as the template for endurance races going forward, but although we were promised more, including the return of 24-hour races, that hasn't really come to fruition. The only other race that could be considered an endurance is another one-hour race at Spa added a few months later, but other than that, it's been complete silence. But hey, if we consider the eight races they added, plus this extra one, and the three shorter ones which were already in the game, that's 12 in total, which compares favourably to the 9 in both GT5 and 6, and even the 10 from GT3. And as I said, there's decent variety among these events, so surely plenty of replay value. Well, here's the problem. With the exception of that one race at Spa, none of these events can be replayed for money. When you've completed them once, there is no incentive to ever do them again. My favourite part of GT7 has just been flushed down the toilet. You see, aside from the Spa race, all of these endurances exist within the missions. And, among other things, one of the quirks of missions is that they only give out prize money once. Which makes sense for a 20 second challenge where you want to reward the player but not make it overpowered for grinding money, but not an hour long endurance race. So, pretty much all replay value, such as trying to beat the races with different cars or handicapping yourself in some way to make them harder, it all goes completely out of the window. And this, combined with the fact that they seem so reluctant to add any new ones, really hurts its rating. 6 out of 10 is all I can offer. And that's painful to say, because when these races work, they really work. But the game is just so poorly optimised to allow them to shine. It just feels like they exist primarily as a showcase for what the game can do technically, rather than the experience they can offer to the players. Not to mention that the ideas they experimented with in sports didn't return. 20 cars is always the maximum, and there are no true multi-class races. Although, given how abysmal the AI is, maybe that's for the best. Custom race can be used to create your own endurance races, sure, but that's not an excuse, since 1. Setting up a custom race with decent AI is nigh on impossible, and 2. It's their job to design the game for us. We shouldn't be expected to do it ourselves. And considering the meagre payouts for custom race, it is just for fun. But anyway, those are the endurance races from all 8 of the mainline GT games scored. Bear in mind that these marks are relative to what is technically possible for that game, and the context of the games that came beforehand. So for instance, GT7's endurance races are far better than GT1's, but they both score a 6 given the experience they're each able to offer relative to what was actually possible in each situation. Of course, GT7 is still subject to change, given that it's being regularly updated, so its score is as of August 2023. GT6 is the outlier, as there are no proper endurance races, so consider its score separately from the rest, purely based on how well it does what it's trying to do. But the numbers alone will never tell the full story. So it has to be asked, what is the deal with endurance races in Gran Turismo? One thing that should be clear from this video is that the relative importance and how much time and effort has been poured into endurance races has fluctuated massively between the different games. In GT1, they were a fun novelty that could be ultimately ignored, although given that there weren't that many events in GT1, I imagine most players would try them out at some point. In GT2 and GT3, they were a lot more integrated into the career and there were stronger incentives to do them. Still, you could ignore them entirely, but you would be missing out on some great, sometimes game-breaking, rewards. GT4 was similar, although locked them off entirely in the early game given the 25% completion requirement. Still, there were plenty of races to dive into that would be worth your while to complete at any point after you unlock them but the inclusion of much longer races did start pushing them in a more exclusive late-game direction. 
GT5 pretty much solidified this, as you can only unlock them once you've unlocked every other event, and each individual endurance would unlock in a very linear way. This is the point where it felt like endurance races started to feel a bit like an afterthought, especially when considering the 8 events that were cut, but they still cared to some degree. With GT6, they went in a completely different direction. The MO was to capture the feeling of an endurance race in a much shorter format, combined with a streamlined career structure that again made these races exclusive to the late game. GT Sport tried to bring things back to its roots with one hour endurance races at the longest, long enough to unfold in an interesting way, but never long enough to become tedious. They did try a couple of interesting things, but it mostly felt like they were included as a necessity rather than having any grand ideas for them. And finally, GT7, where they have all the reason to implement fully fleshed out endurance races and have everything at their disposal to make that a reality, but they just seem to have very little interest in actually doing it. They practically needed to be forced into adding those one hour races. And that's where we are in current day. The thing about Gran Turismo is that it's always been one of those games where it's all about winning all the time. Compare it to something like the Formula 1 games, where in a career mode it's more about building up, getting gradually more competitive, until you can challenge for regular wins and eventually the championship. GT has never really been like that. And that isn't a bad thing, the structure and appeal is different, but I just feel like this way of playing has limited what they can do with endurance races. In the older games, you would ideally have a decent margin over your opponents. It was always best to err on the side of caution, given how difficult it was to know exactly how fast they would be over the course of a race. You could try and match yourself with them more closely, but for most people, it just wasn't worth the risk. Who would want to jeopardise winning a multiple hour endurance race just to make it a bit more exciting? The trade off is not worth it. And that's the problem endurance races have always had. Because with GT, if you weren't almost guaranteed to win, then there isn't any point in investing that much time into them. But only by doing that and really challenging yourself can you have the best races, the ones that feel the most rewarding when you do win. This is why most endurance races, especially in the older titles, would devolve into a procession. It was a balance between an intriguing race and an inevitable outcome, and most would swing towards the latter. And I think this mentality is partially what makes Polyphony so reluctant to fully develop endurance races based on their real life inspiration. Yes, we've got tyre wear, fuel usage, changeable time and weather, etc, and all of these variables can be put together to make some interesting races and scenarios, but there is still so much more they can do. From real life inspiration, they could have safety cars, red flags, full retirements, much more detailed mechanical damage, and plenty more of these things which you could find in real endurance races that make them so exciting and unpredictable. Who wouldn't want to take part in a race as dynamic as that? And that mentality is great for something like the F1 games, but not so much for Gran Turismo. I know that these things which I view as interesting gameplay ideas would lead to frustration for a lot of people. I mean, imagine that you've been dominating a race, and then the safety car comes out with a few laps to go, bunching up the field, and then at the restart you make a mistake and plummet down the order with no chance of catching up in time. You could argue that's just the harsh reality of racing, because it is. But for a game like Gran Turismo, where it's all about winning every race, not just completing races and then moving on, that situation just isn't acceptable. You've now wasted your time doing this race which you were almost guaranteed to win. I believe that's the crux of the issue. But that doesn't excuse all of Polyphony's decisions. I think it's important that we add some context about the creator of Gran Turismo, Kazunori Yamauchi. As some of you may know, he is, or was, a fully certified racing driver himself, competing at the Nürburgring 24 hours on six occasions from 2010 to 2016, even winning in class in both 2012 and 2013. The credits of GT6 even showed the real life onboard footage of him racing there. And despite all of that, the last GT game to have full, multiple hour endurance races was GT5, 13 years ago, before he'd even done the bulk of his real life professional racing. 
Don't you think that someone who would have become so ingratiated into motorsport, experiencing all of the highs and all of the lows that come with it, would want to reflect these experiences in some way in the racing game he created? It just doesn't make sense how the drop-off in the importance of endurance races in GT is almost exactly opposed with Kaz's own real-life endurance racing experience. You'd think it would be the exact opposite. Of course, there are some theories as to why endurance racing has taken such a back seat, the main one being accessibility. The way GT7 in particular deals with endurance races, hiding them in the missions rather than being part of the main campaign, is probably the most damning evidence of this. Of course, this started in GT Sport, where originally there was no main campaign, so they had to be put somewhere, but they still insist on doing this in GT7. Even when they mention adding more endurance races in the near term, which they've still yet to do, they specifically said about adding them to the missions. Why? I can only assume that they wouldn't want new players to be intimidated by them if they were to appear in the main World Circuits menu, but that just seems silly when you consider the side effects. Realistically, no one's going to want to replay a 24-hour race, but they might want to listen to the in-game soundtrack. But you can't do that in missions. You also can't see the results screen when you finish. These aren't major issues, but combined with not being able to replay these races for more money, it all points to the fact that these races were not supposed to be forced into the mission format. There's no benefit to this. And the lack of these races at all seems like a very conscious decision. For instance, when Grand Valley Highway, GT7's rendition of Grand Valley Speedway, was added back in February, that would have been a perfect opportunity to include the Grand Valley 300 kilometers, the iconic event that appeared in GT1 through 5. For one, it was a relatively short endurance, lasting less than two hours. It also would have been a great excuse for people to familiarise themselves with the track, and it would have created a tangible link to the old Grand Valley Speedway. This would have helped many of us older fans, who were jaded by Grand Valley Highway, to warm up to it. And not to mention that GT7 just desperately needs more races anyway. But despite it being a winning situation for everyone, they just didn't. I'd really prefer that things like this were just an oversight, but it's just so obvious. It has to be deliberate. Another theory I've seen is that if they add longer endurance races, there could be an issue with people losing their progress, given that GT7 requires an internet connection even for the single player. But didn't the same thing apply back in the day with GT4 and people having power cuts or their PS2 overheating? I've heard the horror stories. Either way, if they could implement some sort of autosave feature during these races, that would solve it. Some would even argue that the GT5 style mid-race saves would be good enough. It's clear that many people want full endurance races to return. If you go into any online discussion where endurance races in the older GTs are mentioned, you will find no shortage of people pining for them to come back. Sure, this may be a vocal minority, but I don't see why they can't add them in some capacity, in a way where if people don't want to do them, they don't have to for absolute completion. Personally, I've never done a full 24-hour race in one of these games, so I do get it. I mean, do I seem like the type of person who would spend all day and all night playing Gran Turismo? Actually, don't answer that question. My preference has always been for the races lasting between 90 minutes and 3 hours. I feel like that's a good balance. When it comes to league racing, I've always enjoyed endurance races far more than sprints. That's why I'm racing in a GT7 league just like that right now, so I can get my fix. If the same level of unpredictability you can find in these races could be translated to single player endurances, I think that would be a winning formula that many could enjoy. Full 24 hour races aren't really necessary to get that feeling. What they could do is have a system where you can optionally scale down a 24 hour race to a 12 hour race, or 6 hours, or 3 hours, and receive reduced rewards, but it still counts for full completion. And really, if people enjoyed the Enduros in the older games, just think how much better they could be in current day. It really is bizarre when you think back to GT4, and how Polyphony thought it was a good idea to introduce these super long races, up to 24 hours, when they had no in-game time simulation, no changeable weather, no mechanical damage, and only 5 opponents across these massive circuits. And now, when they finally have all of the tools and resources available to them to fully realise these ideas in the game, they just don't give a shit anymore. It's the most backwards logic. What changed? You could say this about a lot of things in GT7, but I feel endurance races are the most egregious example. 
and that's not even talking about new features they could introduce, because frankly, most of the ideas you'll find in GT7, even the good stuff, were things that already existed as far back as GT5. Just now they're done a bit better. So let me put it this way. We have a creator who has first-hand experience of real-life endurance racing. A community that is begging for races like these to return and be expanded on. And a game which serves as an excellent technical basis to simulate things which seemed unthinkable 20 years ago. And somehow, despite all of that, out of all of the games that feature them, GT7 does the worst job of implementing endurance races in a way that gives people a reason to care. I know there are plenty of people who have no interest in endurance races, but I do, and I know there are many others just like me. It has always been one of the pillars of Gran Turismo, so to toss it aside as if it's not a big deal is a disservice to the entire franchise and what it originally stood for. To get people invested in not just car culture, but actual racing. And as far as real racing goes, the endurance races in the older GT games were as close as they ever got. Until they actually fulfil the clear potential that endurance racing has in these games, or publicly explain their decisions as to why they continue not to, this will always be a mystery to me. And that's why I consider endurance races to be the biggest enigma in Gran Turismo.